Hello, my name is Jordan Pruitt. I am a student here in the Veterinary Technology Program at Parkland College. Today I would like to tell you about one of the classes that we take here in our two years in the Veterinary Technology Program. The class is called Clinical Pathology, and to make it simple, it's basically the study of the, of the disease. So in Clinical Pathology, we have to take Clinical Pathology 114 and Clinical Pathology 115 before we graduate here. We do a plethora of things in Clinical Pathology. One of those things that I'm going to show you today is how to make a blood smear. So when we make a blood smear, we want to make sure that we stay within an eighth of an inch from the edge of the slide. And we also want to make sure that the length of our smear is about one third to one half the length of the slide. Something that we want to avoid is having holes, vertical streaks, or horizontal streaks on our slide because then our slide is fatal and we essentially have to remake it. We also want to make sure that our slide is bullet shaped and has a feathered edge as opposed to a flat front. And the area that we will be examining is called the mono layer. So I'm going to show you how we do that real quick. First, I'm going to go ahead and invert my blood eight times to make sure that it is good and mixed. There we are. So I'm going to go ahead and drop a little bit of blood here in my crit tube. And once I think I have enough to make a smear, I'll go ahead and stop filling it. Okay, so I think that will be enough to make a smear. And when I'm making my smear, I want to have about a 30 to 40 degree angle. I'm going to slowly draw back and then push forward. It's not always perfect, but we're going to see what we end up getting here. So I'll take my crit tube. I'll place a small drop of blood on my smear, just about that big. Then I'll take my other slide, and this is the slide I want to have that angle with. What I'm going to do is I'm going to slowly draw back and then push forward. As you can see, it didn't turn out quite how I want it. It takes a lot of practice. So for demonstration purposes, I pre-made a slide here for you. This is a pretty good slide. As you can tell, there's a couple holes, but not too many. Not too many in our monolayer. We have our feathered edge and our bullet shape. We're about one half of a length down the slide, and we still have a little bit of room on the sides as well. So this is a pretty good smear here. Now what we're going to want to do before we examine our smear under the microscope is stain it. So I'm going to go ahead and head over to the staining station over here, and we can go ahead and stain our slide. Now that I am ready to go ahead and stain my slide, I am first going to dip my slide here in the absolute methanol, which is our fixative solution. I'm going to do this five times. So one, two, three, four, and five. Let it drip off a little bit. Now I'm going to dip my uh, blood smear here in solution one, which is our red solution, five times. One, two, three, four, five. And I'll let that drip off as well. And then lastly, I'll go ahead and put my smear here in solution two, which is blue, five more times. One, two, three, four, and five. And then after that, I want to use distilled water and rinse my slide off. And then I'll allow it to dry. However, for demonstration purposes, we are just going to use a clean slide while I go ahead and show you how we would evaluate that on the microscope. So now we're going to go ahead and pretend like our slide has dried completely and now we can examine it under the microscope. So the first thing I'm going to do is examine my slide under the 40 times objective, which is this blue one right here. And I also have to make sure that my diaphragm is also on 40 times. I want bright light on my rheostat and I want my condenser all the way up. What I'm going to do at this point is look into the microscope and just make sure that I can visualize all the cells if my cells did not pick up enough stain, I can actually fix that by re-dipping my slide in the solution one or solution two, usually solution two, a few more times. 
Now, if my stain is too dark, I unfortunately cannot fix that, and I would have to remake my smear completely. So I would look under, and once I can confirm that I can go ahead and see all of my cells, I now want to switch back to 10 times for my objective, back to the yellow. I still always want my condenser all the way up, and I still want that bright light. But now I'm going to look for a species called microfilaria. This is microfilaria. It is commonly seen in the blood of the canine species. Sometimes it can be seen in feline blood as well. Microfilaria is associated with heartworm in dogs. Fun fact, heartworm in dogs is caused by a parasitic worm called dibrofilaria amidus. When we see just one of these in the blood, the dog is considered positive for microfilaria. So it doesn't take a certain amount for us to decide if an animal is positive or negative. Just seeing one makes our patient positive for microfilaria. After we discover and decipher if a, our patient is positive or negative for microfilaria, we can now move on and go ahead and check out our white and red blood cells. So when we do this, we want to go ahead and switch to 100 times oil immersion. But we have to use a handy dandy tool called immersion oil in order to visualize these cells. So go ahead and place the oil immersion oil on our slide. Then we could go ahead and switch. We also want to make sure that our diaphragm is on 100 times again. We still want that condenser up and we still want that bright light. So now we can visualize our white and red blood cells. So first we're going to talk about the five white blood cells and I'll show you a picture of that on the slide and explain those. These white blood cells are known as neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. These are normal white blood cells that we should see under the microscope. We have to count them and note any abnormalities. There is a large amount of abnormalities, but for now, I will just show you one. This is a toxic neutrophil. We rule it out as a toxic neutrophil because of those round, angular, bluish colored bodies that we see in the cell. Those are called dull bodies. These make a neutrophil toxic. We also have to take a look at our red blood cells. This is what a normal red blood cell should look like. However, there are many abnormalities that we have to watch out for. One of those abnormalities is called crenation. This is what crenation looks like. You can see the difference between a normal red blood cell and a crenated one. The crenated one is shriveled up with bumpy edges, while the normal one is round and smooth. We have a special way of documenting and reporting crenation. Here is a quick glimpse at what a typical differential report looks like. As you can see in the report, we also have to evaluate the platelets and many other things. This report is basically how we show our findings. This is just a small glimpse as to what we do. We use the data that we find here to diagnose our patient. For example, if an animal has a higher white blood cell count than normal, that may lead us to believe that an animal may have an infection since the white blood cells are multiplying, and those are the main cells that fight off our infections. And these instruments are the instruments that we use to help us count white blood cells and platelets. This instrument right here is our platelet counter. This helps us keep track of how many platelets we count. We do count um, about 10 fields of platelets, and um, yeah, however many there are on this number box by the end of our 10 field count, that tells us how many platelets there were in 10 fields, and then we can average them so we know about how many platelets we actually had per each field. And then this is our white blood cell counter. As you can tell, it has a spot for each type of white blood cell that we discussed earlier. And what I do is I just press down, and it counts for me how many types of each blood cell that I see. And then at the very end, I can use that to essentially report how many I saw of each type, their absolute values, and their percentages, as you saw on our differential report. Before I go, I would like to show you one more thing, and my peer here, Terry Arnold, will be talking to you about that next part of the video. Okay, so this is a picture of the microfilaria. If you recall, Jordan told you about how she looks for microfilaria on the blood slide. Um, I'm going to show you these uh, here in this jar. These are what adult heartworms look like, and so they really uh, infect the heart, and so it's really important for us to give our pets a heartworm treatment. And then uh, we're going to look at uh, some of the ova that we might see on the microscope. Uh, the one here on the screen is Trichurus. Its common name is whipworm. They're football-shaped, and they have small little handles at each end. 
Uh, these cause a lot of gastrointestinal is issues whenever uh, they infect the host. Uh, also, uh, here on the left, there's dipalidium, and your pets can be infected by these with fleas. So again, that's why we need to treat our pets for uh, fleas to, to keep them safe. Uh, on the right-hand side at the top, there's two uh, browned, round uh, circles, and those are roundworm ova. Uh, and those are passed in feces, so when our pets eat uh, something that has contaminated feces on it, they can get roundworm. So that's why it's important to pick up after your pets in the yard. So uh, one of the things that we do uh, for our pets is we uh, look at their uh, fecal material, which is basically their bowel movement. Um, we collect the fecal material in a cup. The first thing we do is we want to look at it. We want to see if it's formed or soft, uh, called unformed. Uh, we also want to look to, to see if there's adult worms in there, uh, round worms or tapeworms. We would check for, uh, see if there's any blood in the feces or any mucus or any foreign materials. Uh, after we do the gross exam, then we would take a small sample, about a teaspoon's worth of the uh, fecal material and put it into a cup. I've already got uh, some here in this cup. And then we would add about 15 mils of uh, fecal float solution. What the solution does is it uh, makes the ova float to the top because they're lighter than the solution. So then we would take our little tongue depressor here and mix it up real good. And uh, after, after we've mixed it, then we would strain it, uh, strain the fecal material into this other cup, like that, and uh, throw, the, throw the solids away. We don't need that anymore. Uh, at this point, we would throw, uh, put our solution into our test tube. Uh, I've already got one prepared here. Uh, we would fill this up so that there's just a reverse meniscus, which means the liquid just is above the top of the test tube just a little bit. Uh, when we have that prepared, then we would uh, take our cover slip, which is this little piece of clear plastic, and we would put it on top of the test tube. Uh, we would have to wait about 15 minutes. That gives the ova time to float to the top and get attached to the cover slip. After 15 minutes, we would take our cover slip off and put it here on our little slide. I've got a slide here. I'll just drop that on. Uh, and then we would take our slide and put it on the microscope and we would examine it, the whole slide, uh, under low light and low power. Thank you so much for taking the time to be a part of what we do here as students in the veterinary technology program and thank you for your unending support as we work hard to become certified veterinary technicians. Welcome to Cat Anatomy, I'm Selena. And I'm Kelly. We have a lot to show you today. So to start off with, cat and dog anatomy is very similar to our human anatomy. What I mean by that is the internal structures, the way that they look, their functions, their locations, very similar as to the human body. Anatomy quickly became one of our favorite classes simply because learning about the internal structures helps us know um, how we can assist during an exam and where things are placed. So if we need to do venipuncture or if we need to give injections, we know exactly where to go. First, we're gonna talk about our large animal legs. Okay, so here we have a cow and a horse leg. So you can tell the difference by looking at the feet. So the cow has the two toes and the horse just has the one hoof. We also have a good example of what a front limb would look like and a hind limb. Um, so here we have scapula, this is the humerus, ulna and radius, the carpals, and the cannon bone, the three pastern bones, P1, P2, and P3, it's the coffin bone or the hoof. And then for the horse leg, this is for the back leg, this is the femur, patella, the tibia, and the fibula. This is the hawk and the cannon bone. We have, in a horse, we have the splint bones. And then the pastern bones again, P1, P2, and P3. So this is what the inside of a bone would look like. We have the um, cancellous bone, which is the light and spongy part of the bone. And then the outside is called the compact bone, which is the more protective, heavy, dense layer of the bone. And then here we have a skeleton of a dog. So it's just um, 
a cool image to see how the vertebrae or the spine are similar to a human body and then how they do have the bones in the tail as well. Those are called coccygeal bones. And this is a canine skull, um, and you can tell how different they are between the cat skull. It's very small, you can see their teeth. All right, moving on to our plasticized cat. Um, this is good because you can see all of the internal structures. And first I'm gonna start out with pointing out some veins and arteries. Just a note, um, the veins are dyed blue here for our learning purposes, and the um, arteries are dyed red, just so that it's a little bit easier to learn. This is not the color that they are internally in a living animal. Here on either side of this trachea here, we have our jugular veins. This is one of the most common spots for venipuncture. Next to it, this red here, this is the carotid artery. Next, we're going to move to another common site for venipuncture. On a cat, you would use the medial saphenous, <coughs> which is here. On a dog, you would much rather use the lateral saphenous, and that would just be on the other side. We are unable to see that currently. Okay, and then we have a couple nerves to show you as well. So um, up here again near the jugular and carotid vessels, we have the... Um, vagus nerve that runs along in here. And then um, back here where we would do um, injections um, in the hamstring, back here we would have the sciatic nerve, which we have to take care and avoid when giving an, uh, an intramuscular injection. Speaking of injection sites, as Selena was just pointing out the hamstring here, that's one of the most common. We also have the quadricep here. Okay, and then it is very interesting to take note of the cat and dog lungs. They have five lobes in their lungs, whereas humans only have two. And then we have the heart here in the middle of the lungs. Um, the, noting the position of the heart is very useful when looking at x-rays. The um, point of the heart is called the apex, and that lays toward the left side of the body. This is an example of a real heart. So as I mentioned, the apex is the tip of the heart, and it points toward the left side of the body. This is how it would sit. And then here we have some uh, brain to show you. So full first we will start out with the full brain here. We have the cerebrum. That's going to be this part here. This is going to be the most rostral, which means it's most towards the nose. This is responsible for learning and intelligence. Coddled to that, we have the cerebellum. That is located here in this area. And the cerebellum is responsible for major reflexes. Next, we have the brainstem here. And the brainstem um, controls the ba most basic of body functions. Um, you can tell on the back here, it, it runs right under the optic chiasm. This is where the optic nerves actually cross. And then here we have an example of what the inside of a brain will look like. This is just a half. Um, again, we have the cerebrum and the cerebellum. And if you can see in the cerebellum, we have um, our white and gray matter, which both have different purposes in, in the body. Um, we have our brain stem, which leads into our spinal cord. Um, and then here, this ear-shaped structure is called the corpus callosum. Um, and then right in here, we have our diencephalon, which contains the thalamus and the hypothalamus, which controls um, hormone function. And then right below it here, we have the pituitary gland. These all work together with each other. So the last thing with the brains that we <coughs> want to talk about is the cranial nerves. There's 12 of them, and trying to learn them can be kind of difficult sometimes, so coming up with little nifty ways to help remember is always a good idea. So first I just want to say um, that they are labeled 1 through 12, and you do use Roman numerals. The first one is going to be our olfactory, and that controls smell. How you can remember that is you have one nose, so number one, olfactory. Next, we have the optic nerves, and you can remember that because it's number two, and you have two eyes. Okay, and then as we mentioned before, the vagus nerve, um, which is located in the neck, it helps with control of the respiratory and gastrointestinal tract. It also works with the um, um, chest and abdominal organs. So um, we also have a facial nerve. It will be right along here in the cheek. 
Um, it's responsible for facial muscles. It also helps with salivation and tear production. Thank you for joining us today in our cat anatomy lesson. We hope that you have learned something. This is our main lab here at Parkland for the Vet Tech program. This is where we learn our small animal nursing skills, such as drawing blood, um, doing physical exams, and learning how to prepare for and assist with surgery. Um, and now I'm gonna show you how to practice drawing blood on a dog. So I've got my fake leg here that we use um, before we learn um, how to draw blood on a real patient. Um, and so the first thing I'm going to do um, when I'm getting ready to draw blood is tighten this tourniquet. And so that um, allows the vein to be held off so that I can get blood from it. Um, next, I'm going to open my um, needle and syringe. And so this is what I'm going to use to actually collect the blood. Um, next thing I'm going to do is um, use alcohol to prepare the area. So this does three things. Um, it wets down the hair on the leg, it makes the vein stand up, and it cleans off the area of any debris. And so I'm just going to um, douse the area a bit. Um, it doesn't need to be soaked, but just enough. Um, I'm going to remove my needle, or remove the cap from my needle, and then I'm going to insert it into the vein at an angle, and then as soon as it's in, I'll flatten it out, and then start aspirating with my syringe. And so um, it'll depend on how much blood that is um, needed for whichever blood test is being done. But once I have as much as I need, um, I will release the tourniquet, hold my thumb over the area before I remove, remove my needle, pull it out, and then hold off the area so that it doesn't bleed or bruise. Um, while I'm holding it off, I would have um, an assistant um, transfer the blood from the syringe into this blood collection tube. And then this will um, store the blood um, until it is um, ready to go into a blood machine to be tested. I'm now going to show you how we perform a dental on our patients. So this is our ultrasonic scaler. It's what we use to clean and polish your patient's teeth. So the first step, once your patient is all prepped and ready, would be to take our calculus removal forceps. These are used to break large chunks of calculus off the patient's teeth. And then we would spray the patient's mouth with this Nolvison spray and just let it sit on there to help with the bacteria in the mouth. And then next we're going to take our ultrasonic scaler here, which is what we use. It vibrates to clean the tartar off the teeth. So you'd hold it just the patient would be lateral, so just, and you just do a couple strokes downward to take it all off. You don't want to leave it on the tooth too long because it would, could overheat, overheat the tooth and cause damage. You're then going to spray the mouth again with this Nolvison spray, and then the next step would be to take our dental, handheld dental instruments, and you're going to take it and probe under the gums of the teeth to look for pockets. You also have a dental curette to remove tartar underneath the gum line. And then if your patient would need extractions, that's when the veterinarian would take over and do the extractions. Um, they would commonly use incisor, these are incisor extractor forceps to remove inc incisor teeth. They also make molar extractors. And then if it's a tooth that is harder to get out, they can use the root elevator to loosen it. The next step would be to polish the teeth. So you take your polisher here, along with our Profi paste, and the Profi paste is just a paste with, that's granular, and you'd use it to smooth out the etchings caused by the ultrasonic scaler on the teeth. And then lastly, you're going to take fluoride paste, which is similar to what you'd use at the dentist. You wanna spray it on the patient's teeth, and then let it sit for a minute and just wipe it away, and that's how you would complete a dental. We are now going to show you some of our most commonly used surgical instruments. Our first one is cryohemostats. They come in curved and straight, as well as different sizes. They have serrations on the entire length of the teeth. They're used for clamping tissue primarily. And then next we have our mayo scissors. These can be curved or straight. The tips can be blunt or sharp, or they can be bolt, one of each. They're used to cut dense tissues. The blades are very thick and make up one third of the entire instrument. Then we have our Olsen Hagar needle holders. These are used to hold surgical needles while suturing. 
This type holds the needle at the tip and has scissors further down to cut the suture line. Then we have our scalpel handle, which is used to hold the scalpel blade, which is the primary cutting instrument of the surgeon. We have our scalpel blades. They come in multiple sizes, but most commonly a number 10 is used. I'm now going to show you how to prepare to become a sterile assistant in surgery. So first we're gonna open our sterile gloves and our sterile gown. So our gloves here, we're gonna take and open up. And it's okay if they fall out because the outside isn't sterile. So you're gonna open it like this and then you're gonna grab the bottom edge and kind of tuck it under. You're gonna grab the top edge and tuck it under just so it stays open. You're gonna grab these two tabs on the outside on the bottom and pull your gloves open. And then again, tuck the bottom edge just to keep it open. And now these are open, so you'll move on to your gown. So for your gown pack, you're gonna have this piece of tape that if it has been sterilized, will have black stripes across it. You wanna make sure it's within, made within six months so it is still sterile. So you're gonna remove your tape. And then you're gonna, put, I put one hand on the pack. And you're gonna pull this tab and toss it away from you. Grab your side ones and pull them off to the side. In this case, we're gonna grab right here under it and pull it this way. And then your last tab, you're gonna pull towards you and then your pack is open and you can no longer touch it and everything is open. So now we're going to um, wash, scrub our hands for surgery. So first we're just gonna wash our hands with soap and water like you normally would and pick under our fingernails. And then you're gonna dry your hands just like normal. And then you're going to use three pumps of Avogard, one on each hand and then it doesn't matter what hand you put your third one in and scrub your arm, hands and arms and then you will just let them dry before doing your gowning and gloving. And you need to make sure that the Avogard is on your skin for five minutes. So now that we have done our Avogard and our hands are aseptic, we're going to put on our gown and gloves. So you're gonna make sure your strip is turned black. This means it's been auto sterilized. And you're gonna pick up your gown and take a step back. And we're gonna your hand and you're gonna let it drop. And hold it by the collar. Slide your arms into the gown without putting your hands through the cuff. And then it's gonna come tie me into my gown. And now that you've been tied into your gown, we're going to put on our sterile gloves. So I'm gonna do my right hand first because I'm right-handed and it's just what I tend to do. But you're going to pick up your glove through your gown without sticking your fingers through the cuffs, you're going to put it cuff to cuff and thumb to thumb. And then you're going to grab the rolled edge of each side of the glove. And then in one swift motion, you're gonna pull the glove over your cuff and onto your hand. And it doesn't usually turn out for most people the first few times, but this is okay because your cuff is covered, so we can go ahead and put the other glove on. So you're gonna do the same thing. You're gonna pick up your glove and put it cuff to cuff and thumb to thumb. Grab the rolled edge of each side and pull it over again in one swift motion. Then we're going to, now that I've got them both on, I can fix my fingers here. Now that I have my sterile gown and gloves on, I am going to head into surgery. So this is our surgery suite. We've got kind of a mock setup going on. And so I'm going to show you um, our machines, our monitor, and then our um, materials that we use during um, a procedure. And so over here, we have our anesthetic machine. And so we have things like the vaporizer to deliver the anesthetic gas to the patient, um, our rebreathing bag to recycle fresh air through the system, our oxygen tanks are down here, and they um, provide the oxygen to the patient, and then the oxygen flow meter that controls how much oxygen is going to the patient. Next we have our monitor. It um, shows the recordings of the patient's heart rate, respiratory rate, and blood pressure so that we can continually monitor that throughout the procedure. Um, right here we have our fluid pump and so this automatically pumps our um, 
IV fluids to the patient. Um, there's also a manual way to do it, but using a fluid pump is much easier. Um, over here, we have our Mayo stand. And so this is going to contain, this tray is going to contain all of the instruments that the surgeon should need during the procedure. This is a sterile field. Um, and so the surgeon can touch everything in here and um, as well as the um, sterile field over here on the patient. Um, and then over here near the anesthetic machine, we've got our area with extra supplies, extra syringes, needles, suture for when um, the surgeon is placing stitches after a procedure, and then things like gauze squares and alcohol. So this machine is called a bear hugger and it um, supplies the patient with warm air. So the warm air comes through this tube and in, um, onto the patient, onto a nice blanket. Um, it's important to keep the patient warm during the procedure. Um, this table is also um, heated, and so that also helps to keep the patient warm. So after a patient is done in their surgical procedure, sometimes they'll need a bandage placed. And so there are a couple different bandage, bandage types that we can place, um, but one that I'm going to show you today is called a foot bandage. Um, and so I've got all the materials that I'll need already laid out. It includes gauze squares, two inch tape, one inch tape, um, gauze roll, vet wrap, and um, of course your bandage scissors and a Sharpie to write your initials and the date that you placed the bandage. So first, the first step of placing this bandage is to use your gauze squares. You've got um, two that are opened up and placed into an X and then use two more gauze squares to place in the middle. That provides a little bit more cushion while the dog is walking on it because this bandage is meant to allow the dog to walk on this paw while it's bandaged. So the next step is going to be to place the gauze squares over the end of the foot. It should cover the whole foot. Place it smoothly so that, um, so that it doesn't cause any discomfort. And then you're gonna use one of your strips of one inch tape to just um, tape the gauze directly onto the patient so that it doesn't fall off. You also want to tape this as smoothly as possible, but sometimes it doesn't always go on super smoothly and that's okay. So once you have your gauze squares taped on, the next step is going to be to use your gauze roll. And so when you're rolling the gauze on, it should provide some compression. Um, and so you want to roll with the roll facing up and then roll from the toes up the leg. That's to avoid what's called the tourniquet effect and that um, can cut off blood circulation and cause several other problems that we don't want to cause. And so you'll want to roll um, overlapping about halfway each time and then your bandage will stop just above the dog's carpus which is um, sort of comparable to a wrist in humans. And so that's gonna be about there. Use your bandage scissors and cut the gauze. That doesn't need to be taped down, it usually just sticks to itself. The next thing is gonna be use your two inch tape and this is going to um, kind of act as a um, reinforcement for the bottom of the foot, again, while the dog is walking on it. And so it, it's sort of called um, a booty, and so that it just um, goes right on the bottom of the foot, and that just again provides some more reinforcement so that the dog can walk on it. Next step is going to be to use your vet wrap, and so this is a self adherent um, cover basically for the bandage. And so again, you'll want to roll with your with the roll facing up, roll from the toes up the leg. And again, you do want to provide some compression. Again, rolling um, with about a halfway overlap each time. And then you want the vet wrap to end above where your gauze roll ended so that the dog can't chew at it or anything. All right, and then you take your bandage scissors and cut it. Smooth it over nice and neatly. The last step is going to be to use another strip of one inch tape, place it in a barber pole fashion around the leg, 
on the outside of the vet wrap. And then with your Sharpie, you'll write your initials and the date that you placed it so that they know when it needs to be replaced. Some bandages can only stay on for a day, some can stay on for longer than that, but as long as there's a date on it, then there's no question about when it needs to be replaced. And that is a foot bandage. So today, Abby and I are going to show you uh, what we do here in the radiology class at the Vet Tech program at Parkland. Uh, this is our x-ray machine. Um, the x-rays are radiation. They're high energy electrons. Uh, they come out of this part of the machine and expose a digital plate on this table, in, inside this table. Um, a few years ago, uh, there wasn't digital. It was a film plate under here and uh, the x-rays exposed a film, and then the film was developed in the developer in a dark room. So because this is radiation, it's really important that we are careful uh, about exposure to ourselves and to the animals. Um, so anytime we x-ray an animal, we record in this log uh, what views were taken, the animal's name, uh, and how much radiation they received uh, by putting in the settings that are on the table. To protect ourselves, we wear this lead equipment, uh, a lead gown, a thyroid collar, and these heavy lead gloves, which actually make it really hard to hold onto the animal, but they're important. Uh, and then to track how much radiation we receive, we wear these dosimeter badges. Uh, so now Abby and I are gonna show you how we make an exposure. Um, and then Abby will show you some uh, images that have been taken and explain them to you. So. What we need to do is we need to make sure that she's under the little machine here. And we can light her up here and move her around. And then we can open the collimation up. And what this does is it makes sure that um, we're not exposing too much of her um, or too much of ourselves. So we're going to just do, uh, let's do her, we're going to do her thorax. Wait. What do you think, Abby? Does that look good? Yeah, looks pretty good. Okay, and so we have to make sure to put our markers on here so that we know uh, what side of the animal is up and down. So this is on her right side, and we're doing a ventral dorsal. It means it goes through her tummy side and comes out her backside. So now I'm going to put on my gloves. Yeah, you're such a good puppy. Okay, and we want to stretch her a little bit. Uh, and make her kind of straight in this trough. And then um, our colleague would uh, step on the little pedal over there. Uh, what that does is it spins up the machine and generates the electrons. And then uh, when they depress the pedal all the way, then it takes the picture. So this is an example of a x-ray done on an abdomen, which is kind of similar to the thoracic radiograph, which we did earlier, except it's just lower on the body. When deciding if the x-ray is of diagnostic quality, we look at contrast. The contrast is the difference between the, the white, the lightest part of the radiograph, and the dark. You would want great contrast in a quality diagnostic x-ray. The bone in this x-ray is white, and the black is black rather than gray. This means that the contrast is very high quality, and this would be a good diagnostic radiograph. So here are some good examples of some radiographs that we have here at Parkland. During our first weeks during radiology, we practice by doing radiographs of objects to understand the contrast between metal, which is the light part, and air, which is the black. On our normal radiographs, the bone does not quite resemble the metal because the metal is more solid and stops more of the x-ray. So here's a good example of a feline thorax and abdomen. This black area here is the lungs, and it's black because there's air in the lungs. And here is a very faint heart stopped by the x-rays because it is tissue. It's not bright like the bone because it is a soft tissue. It comes more across as a gray. So here's an example of a buckshot. We surprisingly get a lot of patients that have been shot by a buckshot. So kind of like the feline thorax and abdomen, it looks similar, but you have these really bright 
spots all over this radiograph. This is the metal buckshot from the bullet. So for some more unusual radiographs that we don't see quite often, here's an, of one of a snake, a rabbit, frog, and a bird. This one up here, and I don't know how sh clear this will show up, but the, there are metal screw, screws and pens from a fracture repair and an elbow. So this is our dental x-ray machine. It's just like how it would be at any other human dentist, just more compact. Except with this one, unlike human dental radiographs, it is a little bit more complex because the anatomy of animal teeth is a little bit different than ours. When we take a radiograph, we use what's called the bisecting angle technique. The reason that we use the bisecting angle technique is to avoid elongation or foreshortening of the radiographic image. This technique is usually done on incisors, canines, and some of the premolars and molars. To do this, you need two pieces of information, the plane of the film and the plane of the long axis of the tooth. The line that equally divides the distance between the two planes is the bisecting angle. The beam is then aligned so that it is perpendicular to the bisecting angle. And here's an example of what, it, what the radiograph would look like. So thanks for joining us uh, for uh, what we're doing here in uh, radiology class, and we hope you've learned something about uh, our x-ray machines.